Good morning. Uh, welcome to the 11th meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present uh, to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items 5 and 6 in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The second item on the agenda is to take evidence from the Committee on Climate Change on its annual progress report. Can I welcome Adrian Galt, the Acting Chief Executive. Good morning, Mr Galt. Good morning. Good morning. And we'll move uh, straight to questions. Um, over the, the, the last few years, uh, we've seen uh, a number of uh, uh, revisits of the baseline. Uh, because of changes in the calculations we've had and changes in methodology, methodologies and assumptions. Um, what impact have these changes actually had? So the first thing to say is that there have been a number, as you say, of changes to the inventory, some of which have led to increases in emissions estimates and some have led to reductions. And they have had significant impact um, in terms of uh, whether or not annual emission reduction targets have been met. So it is significant, uh, and it's important, therefore, in looking at the targets to try and take account of those inventory changes to see what impact they are having. Now, we ought to say that those changes are, in, in a sense, a good thing because they are hopefully improvements in the evidence base, improvements in the way that the measurement is taking place. So it is important to keep up with those and make those changes according to international standards. Could you summarise for us, however, there have been times when the changes have made it easier to hit the targets, there have been times that have made it more difficult. Overall, what has the change been? Well, overall, it, made a couple of, it meant that a couple of the targets were probably not met. More recently, the two, last two annual targets that have been met um, would probably have been met when we've taken account of the inventory changes, they probably would have been met even without those inventory changes. So they made it easier, but taking that out, the target would still have been met, um, reflecting policy measures that have been taken. So at least that, that's been our assessment. And are we at the end game in this process, or will we still be making changes? No, we will almost certainly still be making changes going forward in line with improvements in the methodology. Um, it's difficult to say exactly what that means, um, we almost certainly will, well, we will see the, improve, the um, inclusion in future of upland peat, mm -hmm. and that could make a significant difference to the amount of emissions included in, in inventory for Scotland. So we don't know the exact nature of that as yet, but that is an upward, in, um, upward change that is going to be happening in the next uh, few years. So it's important to bear that in mind when thinking about the uh, targets now. And in terms of... Uh where we are now, to what extent has the unanticipated gotten us to this position? I'm thinking of things like power station closures, uh, fluctuations in weather, bad winters, good winters, whatever. Yeah, we've tried to take account of, of those inventory changes and um, changes in, in, in uh, the weather, so that, well, the, the, the temperature, uh, and allowed for those in our assessments. And as I say, for the last couple of years, we think that uh, the targets that have been met, we think they would have been met even taking account of those uh, that those fluctuations in weather and in the invent inventory. So that is kind of good news that policy seems to be delivering so, uh, emissions reduction. Uh, but <coughs> a lot of this, as you say, so I apologise for my voice, is down to improvements in the power sector uh, and very substantial reductions in emissions. And we can expect there will be more to come in future years. Uh, reflecting closure of Long Gannet, that will, that will have led to big reduction in emissions. So there were one-off changes. OK, thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Um, are there uh, areas in Scottish policy and indeed in UK policy uh, where the policy <coughs> is ahead of the ability to measure uh, what's going on in the policy area? Now, an example I might proffer uh, for you to think about uh, is that in uh, Scotland's 20, uh, 2009 Act, for which I was responsible as Minister, um, we, we attempted to account for what uh, was happening in other countries uh, when we displaced production to other countries. Are we yet 
in the right position and understanding the effect of that and incorporating it in our assessments and other, other areas where we've yet to uh, have sufficiently robust information to, uh, to act upon it. Um, the, on that particular example, which is really talking about consumption emissions, different between consumption and production emissions, there has been an improved evidence base, I think, over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Um, and that has improved our understanding. Um, <coughs> there are still, though, substantial uncertainties there in those calculations. Um, we may have a reasonable understanding of production emissions in the UK, but when you're having to look at worldwide, in, in country by country, or groups of countries, what is going on, the evidence is just not so strong. So <coughs> various averages have to be applied to work these things through. So I think our evidence in terms of what's going on in terms of the broad trends and the difference between production and consumption, we probably have a pretty good feel for that. But I think there's substantial uncertainty still in the individual year figures and some fluctuation that has been observed in the past in those estimates. Okay. <coughs> Other areas, I think agriculture is very difficult in terms of the estimation of emissions. Um, but there is work going on here and in the rest of the UK to look at smart inventory and improving those methodologies. And that will improve the basis for our understanding of the sector and also for the estimation of abatement potential. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Finally, Carson. Well, I, uh, I want to look at the, the balance of effort in the, the climate change plan uh, and, and whether expected emissions uh, reductions are proportionate with actual, with actual <coughs> sectoral uh, emissions and are they balanced and achievable? Um, so, we feel that the balance of effort across the sectors now in the plan is more in line with the kinds of reductions <coughs> that we had in our own scenarios. So there has been a shift to less effort in the uh, decarbonisation of heat for buildings, <coughs> excuse me, and more effort in the transport side. Um, we think that, that we, we can talk about the exact numbers where that ends up but that's moved that balance of effort more in line with the committee's view of the uh, cost effective trajectories um, agriculture i would say there is probably less effort um, than we have in our central or in, in our uh, ambitious scenarios so i think there is um, a question mark there about the potential for further abatement in that sector Okay, if, if a, a sector falls short in expectations and performance in the future, will it allow slack in other sectors? So, for example, we've got agriculture where there's a voluntary approach. Uh, do you have a contingency plan for balancing it uh, right, so you know, one taking up the slack of another? Uh, I don't think there is much contingency in any of these plans because we're really looking at, um, uh, for 2030, 2032, we're looking at a high ambition trajectory to achieve that 66% reduction in emissions, there's not much slack in any sector, I think. Um, so we, we really need to see a high level of achievement across the board. I think there's a question mark that agriculture might be able to go a bit further, maybe. Um, uh, and there, but there's also an issue about um, upland peat emissions coming in. So when that comes in, again, there's a need to look at the abatement potential, but again, that could make things uh, harder going forward. Mm -hmm. Although, at the moment, the projected spend on peatland in the current year's budget does raise a question mark over the extent to which peatland will contribute going forward. Will, will what, sorry, will... Um... The, uh, the, the, the target for peatland delivery has gone up, yeah. but the money being directed to it as things stand has gone down. So there is also a question about the extent to which peatland will contribute, not what it could contribute, but what it will contribute. Yeah, and I think that would need to be continually reassessed and, and uh, as other parts of the plan in terms of what is achievable. Um, but my understanding at the moment is that within the climate change plan, <coughs> abatement fr from um, um, peatland is included within the estimates, though uh, upland peat emissions are not yet within the inventory. Okay. So. John Scott. Well, thank you. Good morning. And declaring an interest as a, a farmer and indeed an upland farmer, um, where's the crossover between farming and peatland management and, and the responsibility for it and, and the credit also to the farming community for the management of peatlands in terms 
of carbon reduction and absorption? I'm not sure that I can answer that question in terms of where the responsibility lies. Well, there's, there's talk about peatland and, and the absorption. Is that, is that a credit to farming, as it were, or is it that just a credit to peatlands? It would be a credit to the land use and land use change um, part of the inventory currently. There's a question mark and issue about how it's incentivised in terms of policy and who who gets that that return, who has the responsibility. But in terms of the inventory, it wouldn't appear within the agriculture part of the inventory at the moment, I think. And soils is that similarly within the management of soils? Is that in which part of the inventory is soil management? So because I think that would again be in terms of the carbon that is sequestered. That would be within land use and land use change. But there's clearly a responsibility that is going to be with farmers um, uh, and policy um, for managing that. Uh, finally, you, uh, Claudia Beanish. Thank you, and good morning to you, Mr. Gork. Could I just uh, go a little further on the um, previous questions from my colleague Finley Carson and ask about you highlighted the phrase cost effective in terms of the different sectors. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on, is there any balance from the perspective of your committee in relation to cost effectiveness and equity between them? Because we've got 9% on agriculture, as, as has been highlighted, and, and much more on others. You know, I mean, it's not particularly easy necessarily to do it in transport any more than it is in agriculture. But I, I'll just value a comment on that. So I think we wouldn't expect, the committee would not expect that every sector would have to make the same percentage reductions. Mm -hmm. We would approach this in part by trying to look at where is it most cost effective mm. to make the reductions. And that would suggest that you're going to go faster in the power sector, for example, um, <clears throat> than you are in agriculture. But there's still a question about what is it cost effective to do in terms of agricultural abatement. And the level of abatement that is within the climate change plan for agriculture is rather less than I think we have in our high ambition scenarios, mm -hmm. which tries to take on board cost effectiveness overall um, for the path towards 80% uh, uh, reductions by 2050. Mm. So it, it would be more a, a cost effectiveness um, situation from the position of, his, of, of your committee, although it might... I, I would suggest could be, in terms of any of the um, governments that you give independent advice to, it could be somewhat more of a political decision in relation to um, the equity of it, if I keep well, pressing that Well, in the word. end, the, gov the government has to make those decisions, yeah. um, not the committee. We just, we're providing advice. Yeah. We're providing advice where cost effectiveness is a, is a key part of our advice, but there are a number of other criteria in the Act that we do look to. Uh, which include things like energy security and competitiveness implications. Uh, and I think you know, we would have a, 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 have, have a mind to some of the equity issues within that. But in the end, the government's got to make those decisions. Right, thank you. And, and just um, a, a couple of other fairly brief questions, I think. Well, they're brief questions. <laughs> I'm not sure it's for you to answer, of course. Um, in terms of the... Um, you'll recall that uh, six microtons of CO2 uh, equivalent from LULUCF, um, with the land use and forestry, has been treated as a windfall um, to allow for reduced ambition in other sectors, in, in some people's view, um, here in Scotland. Um, do you, is it your view as a committee that that should have been banked, um, given what is known about potential fluctuations in future emissions inventories? Um, so we think it is appropriate to take on board um, that latest evidence. Yeah. So I think we wouldn't necessarily in that, in that way regard it as a windfall. We think it's appropriate to take it on board and think mm -hmm. about the implications for abatement in other sectors. Um, but there are then questions about whether there is still potential to go further in some of the other sectors, um, which would mean you wouldn't entirely bank that. Um, yeah. you know, given the high ambition that the Scottish Government has and given, given the intention to move towards even tighter targets, for 2050 and beyond, then there are questions about whether it's possible to go further in agriculture or in buildings or in transport, for example. 
Right, thank you. Just uh, pushing on that further, um, the, the CCP, the Climate Change Plan, has provided uh, for firm new policies, I quote, to ensure that the reductions in Scottish emissions seen in recent years will continue into the 2020s. And uh, I just quote from your own um, uh, progress report very briefly, which says the plan, the climate change plan, uh, as it stands, lacks credibility in meeting the emissions targets for 2032 and fails to prepare properly for deeper decarbonisation in the longer term. Um, I wonder if you could comment on any concerns that you've highlighted through your committee. So that was, um, that was written in relation to the draft plan, not yes. the final plan, Fair of course. <laughs> and the committee has not looked in detail and assessed the final plan. Um, but what I think it is clear when you look at the, the plan, there are some areas where there is still um, there's high ambition, but still a lot more to do to bring forward details of the policies and the instruments that will be used to deliver on that ambition. So, for example, there are very good plans, I think, around energy efficiency and very high level of ambition for energy efficiency um, for buildings. Um, but there is a route map that's going to be produced for the Scottish Energy Efficiency Programme later this year, which, which, which needs to provide more detail about how that ambition is going to be achieved. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, 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 that re that's true in a number of areas where there is a lot more policy development work that still will need to happen to deliver this ambition. Can I just pull you up on what you just said there? Can I be clear? Are you saying that, that the UKCCC has not taken a view on the final plan? Has it been asked to do any work in that regard by the Scottish Government? Well, we would expect to do more work to look at it as part of our future um, work plans for looking at an annual, the annual progress report. Mm. So we would expect to cover it both within the uh, UK um, progress report, which is due at the end of June, uh, and then a Scottish progress report in the autumn. So we will expect to say something further about it on that timeline. Uh, and would you anticipate that anything you had to say would be taken on board? Uh, we would hope that we, what we would have to say would be, would be taken on board. Uh, we've seen in the past that there have been some adjustments to the plans, uh, partially in line with, with, with the advice that we have mm -hmm. provided. So I would expect it to be treated uh, seriously. I'm just a little bit surprised that in the, the period between the draft being weighed and four committees of the Parliament commenting on that draft, along with stakeholders, and the final plan being produced, that the UKCCC had no role in, in, in developing uh, any change that might be made? No, I do not think we had a role in developing it, from, other than the fact that we had provided um, advice within our assessment uh, in the pros report of the draft plan. Okay. Okay, thank you. Claudia Beamish, do you have any further yeah, questions? Thank you. Um, uh, just finally, from my perspective, the um, CCP, com how does it compare, in your view, and or build on the UK's um, clean growth strategy? Um, Are there sort of synergies or, or no, there is stark differences? <laughs> well, in a sense, there are the same issues, yeah. um, which are around the fact that a lot of the progress that has been observed across the UK and in Scotland in recent years has been in the power sector. And we can expect that to continue. <coughs> but the need to move that progress out to other sectors of the economy, and that, so that issue is the same. I think there is a degree of seriousness and ambition in Scotland which is to be commended, which is very high. Um, there has been more um, commitment, I think, um, to, to higher targets uh, in recent years. Mm -hmm. um, but many of the issues still remain that those policies to actually deliver that ambition have got to be further developed. I think Scotland made a good start on that, but there's a lot more to do. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, taking on the theme of it, um, development, uh, Kate Forbes. Great, thanks very much. I'd like to move on to monitoring and governance. In terms, first of all, of the monitoring framework, what input has the CCC had into the development of the Scottish Government's monitoring framework and to what extent does it correspond with the CCC's own framework? Um, I think there are a number of similarities in the kinds of indicators um, that are being developed for monitoring going forward. Uh, I mean, the committee, the CCC, has that kind of framework dating back to 2009, 
uh, when we started developing that uh, framework of indicators that we would monitor over time. There have been discussions with the Scottish Government in terms of that framework and the kinds of indicators that we track and that the Scottish Government might track, um, but it hasn't gone beyond that in terms of helping to advise on exactly what the framework would be. Are you, as a CCC, satisfied that the, the framework <coughs> is, um, is clear and follows the sort of smart policies? Um, I would say not as yet, because what you have in the plan is a kind of indication of some of the indicators in the framework, but a commitment to producing more on that framework in the autumn, I think, in terms of what that will look like and greater detail about what will be tracked and monitored. So I think, again, we'd expect when that is produced that we would come back and look in more detail at that. Thank you very much. And in terms of the, the governance body, has the CCC had input into setting up the governance body and does it have any views on the appropriate structure and functions of that body? I don't believe that we have had fee, uh, fed into that um, process and development. Um, if I am wrong on that, I would return to you and, and let you have further advice. Great. And just one last point around um, external drivers being included as indicators, external drivers like Brexit or unseasonal temperatures. Is there a risk when developing monitoring frameworks that external drivers are then used and um, will take the blame for meeting targets or failing to meet targets? Yeah, there could always be a risk of that. Um, that doesn't mean it's not appropriate to try and take account of the impact that significant external drivers are having. Uh, within the Committee on Climate Change's own framework, we have had those kinds of um, indicators that we've included in our, in, in our kind of tracking um, um, framework. So it's important to try and take account of those, um, but you wouldn't, as you say, you wouldn't want them to, to make excuses for those, but it's important to have, an, have an, in, an indication of what effect those are having and that therefore consider what that means for the rest of the uh, delivery. Yeah. So it's fair to include them. Thank you. I think so. Uh, thank you. Uh, Angus McDonald. Okay, thanks, um, Community. Good morning, uh, Mr. McDonald. Uh, I, I think it's uh, fair to say that we're all of the view that behavioural change and public participation is fundamental to delivering uh, emissions reductions. However, um, similar to RPP1 and RPP2, uh, there's very little mention in the climate change plan of communities and citizens in the sectoral chapters. Um, now, the ISM approach, um, individual, social and material, uh, has been used for the past 10 years, as you know, um, to inform policy design in Scotland. However, there's some concern that the ISM approach hasn't moved on significantly since uh, uh, the last plan. Uh, and there's very little about how uh, citizens were engaged in developing the policies actually mentioned in the plan. So why, in your view, has the ISM approach not evolved uh, over the past 10 years, and would you say it's still fit for purpose? I think I don't know enough about the ISM approach to, to say exactly whether it is fit for purpose going forward. but I. But what I would say is that the importance of those issues and understanding of the behavioural uh, influences and, and how, to, how to affect behaviour increases as we move beyond um, emission reductions in the power sector, for example, as we move into a host of individual decisions that need to be made about uh, how to heat your home or about the car or van that you are going to buy and how, far you, how much you're going to travel. Um, then understanding those individual motivations and how to influence them becomes increasingly important. So there needs to be more focus on how that, uh, how that can be achieved. Okay, and have you d had discussions with um, the Scottish Government with, with regard to, to that, with regard to uh, moving on uh, behavioural change? Um, for example, uh, you know, just to throw in a, an example here, we've got a... Um, a uh, information regarding a blog from Ragnar Lowe from Strathclyde University's Centre for Energy Policy where uh, she highlights that um, uh, the, the need for behaviour change in transport and notes that, uh, um, that the plan's emphasis is on technology and infrastructure with an assumed 27% growth in car kilometres between 2015 and 2035. Um, so, you know, have you had further discussions with the, the Scottish Government uh, on specifically on behaviour change? 
Um, I'm not aware of recent discussions specifically on behaviour change or very substantial discussions. There have been in the past discussions around the issues of behaviour change and the ISM framework. We, though, have done quite a lot of work uh, on some of these issues. So in past reports of the committee, we have looked at some of the behaviour change issues around the switch towards electric vehicles. <coughs> um, and in our report on decarbonising heat uh, towards the end of 2016, there was a lot of work within that uh, about motivations and influencing both individuals and influencing business in terms of the decisions they need to make. And that, that was, those were UK-wide reports, but they would have been equally applicable to uh, Scottish, Scottish issues. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Moving on. Donald Cameron. Uh, th thank you, convener. Uh, can I refer to renewable energy in my register of interests? Um, I'd like to explore uh, emissions and progress in uh, cutting emissions in the energy sector. Um, in the context of both the 2020 target and the 2030 target, um, how do you feel further emission reductions from the energy sector might be realised? So um, there is still substantial scope for emissions reduction from further moving into renewables and in particular um, offshore wind um, through the uh, contra contract for difference uh, process and the, 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 the money that has been set aside for that through to 2025. So there's substantial progress that's still possible there with more, with more generation. Um, there is potential for nuclear. Um, clearly there is the one plant which has got the go ahead. There is potential for further beyond that on a slightly longer time scale, but questions there about the cost effectiveness of, of, of that. Uh, and there's an issue, I think, about onshore wind, which currently there is really no kind of mechanism to, to bring that forward. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, our view of cost effectiveness, we would see onshore wind as potentially playing a role um, where local communities um, want it and are happy to have it. Uh, then that looks to us to be a low cost route to further decarbonisation. Um, can I ask about um, gas-powered generation? Um, and firstly, w what uh, impact does that have on the carbon intensity of the grid? Um, that would depend to some extent on how much that gas plant is running. Mm -hmm. um, so there may be a case for a level of gas capacity but by 2030, we wouldn't expect that to be running very substantially. So it may be there for backup purposes and, and so on. But, but it wouldn't be consistent um, to have substantial gas plant running um, without carbon capture and storage and, and be consistent with meeting our uh, emission reduction targets going forward. Just exploring that, the, I think the climate change plan um, does factor in a role for gas powered um, generation in, in 2050. I think it says it's a, a natural complement to a high renewables uh, future. Uh, and the Scottish Government, I think, um, continue to assume a, a, um, you know, a certain amount of, of generation uh, going forward. What, what's your view about, about in terms of the proportion of what it should be? Should it just be an add-on or, 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 should, or should it be a higher proportion of, of generation? We'd expect it to be a very low proportion of generation. Um, to be consistent with meeting the targets for 2030 and beyond. Now, there, there may be a, some capacity there, but you would not expect it to be running very frequently to, to be consistent with meeting the targets. Um, longer term, for 2050, um, there will be uh, less, less of a role. Uh, we need, if we need to get um, towards uh, net zero emissions in the second half of the century, again, we need to be looking towards moving to... Um, even lower levels of generation from fossil fuels, um, potentially that fossil fuels with capture and storage where, where it's still there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I just explore with you um, the, the issue around the progress that Scotland aims to make potentially being uh, undermined by circumstances out with its control in this particular area? I'm thinking, for example, about four major offshore wind farms being the subject of uh, 
ongoing legal challenge over an extended period, which delayed them. You then have the CFD issue with those offshore wind farms. We've seen solar at one point a couple of years ago was seen as a, a big push forward. That's been undermined by decisions taken, again, out with the Scottish Government's control. So what, to what extent is progress in this regard quite volatile, given that the Scottish Government doesn't necessarily control everything it, it would want to in terms of, of, of making this progress? Um, it, it, it clearly, that progress then from year to year, there may be some volatility that it would be reasonable for those assessing that progress to try and have regards to in thinking about how that's affected um, performance against annual targets. If annual targets are there, then that kind of volatility could make a difference. Um, over time, you'd expect those things to even out or become more reasonable so that the overall trend was looking more reasonable. Um, but for individual years, there definitely could be impact. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, John Scott. <clears throat> Very brief question. There's always the potential of other sectors such as tidal, such as wave energy, such as hydrogen, much discussed yesterday. Um, how, from your vantage point, how optimistic are you that some of those technologies will be game changers? I kind of expect that they will be, but I'm be interested to, to hear of your view on it as someone who probably knows a great deal more about it than I do, certainly. Um, so I think in those kinds of areas, it's important to think about the research that's going on and to be supportive of those new technologies and those developments, but not to bank on them succeeding um, in, 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 in making the plans. So that, that, that points towards a degree of flexibility in the plans going forward as to um, what the makeup of, m might be of generation by different technologies. But I wouldn't be in the business at the moment of incorporating success in those technologies into the future plans. If they are successful, then that's all well and good. Presumably they would be generating it if to be successful at lower cost than the, than the alternatives. So they may, they're worth some kind of investment, um, but, but not going so far as to bank on those producing success. Uh, and, and they do look very difficult. I mean, I, th I think in particular, WAVE. Um, um, you know, th these, these are very difficult conditions uh, you know, f for them to be working in. So I think, um, you know, there are questions about how far you go in those and how far you can bank on those. When you do have other alternatives, you have offshore and onshore wind, which do look to be coming down in cost very substantially. Um, and there's still plenty of further potential to exploit there. A number of question, uh, members want to come in. So, Claudia Beamish to be followed by Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Alec Crowley. Claudia Beamish. Right, thank you, Gavina. Um, could I just um, take you back to your um, very brief remark about the place of nuclear power in, in the mix and just ask you how that relates? I, I obviously, you'll be aware that there is a Scottish Government position on um, not going forward with nuclear at the moment. It's not part of our energy strategy. But could you just comment on... Um, the position of nuclear in terms of cost effectiveness in addressing these issues when you take into account the waste streams and if that's been factored in? So the cost of the waste streams, I think, have been factored into the, the cost calculations. Hmm. What, what we would see now is that for follow-on plants after Hinkley, they would have to come in at substantially lower costs <coughs> than Hinkley for those to look to be cost effective against the alternatives. And we're in a position now where the recent auctions produced a, a cost for offshore wind, um, which, which is substantially lower than anyone yes. was expecting a few years ago. It's mm. a huge success. Yeah. Um, but if you're making that kind of comparison, what does that mean for the cost effectiveness of nuclear? I think that suggests that nuclear would have to be generating at much lower costs than the plant that's been committed to. So the, the only question about is that, how would that be achieved? And I know that some of the EDF I think, and others have, have plans that they think some of that cost reduction is, is possible. Um, but uh, unless you're convinced by, by that, um, I think it's a difficult, difficult argument to suggest that that nuclear would be cost effective. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, before by Alex Rowley. Um, you, you made some comments about annual targets. Now, recognising that annual targets, although we commonly talk in percentages, are actually in tonnes of CO2. <laughs> Um, it, what role is there for some algorithm to smooth, to, to therefore, in effect, 
uh, take account of the one-off or occasional events. Uh, given that when you when your targets are in tons of CO2, in a sense, it's always a long-run thing rather than playing around with percentages. But what scope is there for doing things slightly differently? I think this is, in the end, it's going to be a political decision about, about how you want to, to do this. Uh, I mean, clearly, um, for the UK carbon budgets, those are five-year periods. Yes. And, and those do allow, potentially, for that kind of smoothing. That's one of the attractions of that approach. <coughs> Annual targets um, have um, an attraction, I think, that there will be a particular policy focus on that achievement every year. But it's important in then looking at that achievement to take account of some of those, um, ver ver you know, that some of the factors that, that contribute and produce some variation from year to year. So it's important then politically to have regard to those factors um, in making the assessment of what's being achieved in policy terms. But, you know, in the end, this is, a, this is not a decision, I think, for the committee. It, for my committee, it's one for... for, for, for for you and politicians to make. Alex Riley. On that question about new technologies and Tidal and whatever, is there, in your view, enough of a commitment coming from the UK government to invest research and development, but also to invest to see some of these projects through? Because we have seen some projects are in carbon capture, for example, where the government have pulled the funding. Um, and, you know, is the capacity there not just within the Scottish government, because it's not, but at a UK level to actually bring about the investment that's needed? Or does that need more joined up working? And will Brexit have an impact on that? There is a, um, within the clean growth strategy, there's quite a high emphasis now on innovation um, and research and, and higher spending on, on research and energy research going forward. I think I'm not in a position to say to you whether that's the right level or enough for particular technologies, but it plays an important part of the narrative of the clean growth strategy. Um, but I think it's important not to rely on that as a means of meeting the future legislated targets when we, we know that we have some successful technologies like offshore wind, it's important to focus on de further deployment um, of that technology um, because we can see that that exists. It is producing, um, uh, it's generating at relatively low cost. Um, that kind of points to the importance of deployment of some of the newer technologies rather than early stage R&D. And I think that deployment issue exists for carbon capture and storage as well. That to some extent the government has got to get on with uh, carbon capture and storage and invest more in um, the deployment of the technology and learning from that approach rather than thinking that early stage R&D is the answer. Uh, we've seen with offshore wind that that deployment has substantially brought the cost down. The question is whether that's, still po that's possible also for carbon capture and storage. Mr Rowley is obviously quite right to mention uh, Brexit and its implications. One of the implications, of course, is the, the, the question mark around the ETS scheme and the UK's participation. Can I ask if you've been uh, requested by any of the governments of the, the, these islands to provide advice on the impact of the consequences around uh, ETS if we were to, be, to remain in it? Obviously, it would be quite clear cut if that were possible, but if we were to have some sort of associate membership or if the UK was to set up its own scheme, have you been asked to kind of model the options? No, we have not been asked by any of the governments to look at those implications as yet. Okay, right, thank you. Okay, moving on, Mark Roscoe. Yeah, thanks, Kavita. Um, if we could turn to buildings and carbon reduction from buildings, in the final plan um, we see the emissions reductions and the plans around uh, residential and service sector buildings brought, brought together. Is that something that you welcome? Does that help with uh, clarity and scrutiny of those uh, two, two sectors? Um, so this isn't something that the committee has discussed, so this is just a personal view. The personal view would be I would rather keep them separate, or, um, or at least you know, be very clear on the components 
um, of, of that overall sector. Um, I think some of the potential may be different. It may be able to go faster, perhaps, in the, on the commercial side. So um, that's just but it is a personal view. Mm -hmm. what, why do you think we could go faster on the commercial side? Well, it may be possible that there is scope for some larger scale applications of um, heat pumps, for example. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, um, uh, and district heating as well, with district heating linked to some kind of important, some substantial base loads. So there may be potential to go a bit further, faster in that sector than, um, than the kind of host of individual decisions that mm -hmm. potentially have to may be made when you're looking at residential. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, this is obviously an area where we've seen quite dramatic change from the draft climate plan to yeah. the to the final one. Um, with homes, for example, you know, we started off a 75% target, now down to 23. Um, and in the related area around heat, you know, we've gone from 80% down to 35%. What What's your view about that that reduction? Is it does that reflect? the practicalities, the credibility of steep carbon reduction over a short period of time, or do you think it's gone too far in, in the other direction? I think the, the energy efficiency ambition looks, looks very high, I think, and looks very good, and there's still questions about delivering that and the policy to deliver that, but the ambition looks high. For heat decarbonisation, we commented on the draft plan that we thought that the then um, uh, targets for decarbonisation of heat were too stretching and unlikely to be achievable on that time scale to 2032. Um, when we look at the emissions that the plan has for heat from buildings going forward, the numbers that they have in terms of million tonnes don't look very different to our stretching scenario. But I don't quite understand that. I think there's further work to be done on that because the ambition in terms of that proportion of heat that would be coming from, from low carbon heat sources looks a bit lower than we suggested. So although we thought the original ambition was too high, we suggested that maybe a stretching target would be for 50% to be coming from low-carbon mm -hmm. heat. The pl final plan looks to, looks to have gone lower than that. And I don't quite, at this stage, I don't understand that and why that's the case. Right. Uh, I mean, I think when we had a, <coughs> a briefing from the Scottish Government, they indicated that they'd brought in embedded... Uh, low carbon heat into this new target, including biomass. So I don't know if that's something which may have had some bearing on, on the target. Well, uh, I don't know. I think we, we, mm -hmm. that would be something we would want to explore a bit further to look at the difference in definitions and what's being achieved in the plan or yeah. suggested in the plan compared to our scenario. Okay. At the moment, I can't quite explain it. Right, okay. And, and you know, we just had a discussion about electricity and about innovation and about you know, developing into... Uh, meeting a more stringent target. Where do you see heat, and in particular the domestic market, going here? Um, because in the initial plan we had a, a very ambitious program to 2030. Uh, there was a very steep uh, decarbonisation from 2025, which you know we assumed I think was to do with putting hydrogen into the gas grid or making a major uh, innovative change in the way that we uh, that we supply uh, heat to homes. So. Is there not a danger that by chopping and changing the target, we're sending out mixed messages to industry? How do we, how do we actually plan for a big step change in carbon reduction in the way that we uh, heat our, our, our buildings if it isn't through the grid? So I think we first have to get on with the things now that over the next few years look like those are cost-effective solutions. So things that are low regret, whatever whether it's hydrogen or whatever the long-term options might be. But there are things that we can be doing now which are worthwhile, whatever that final solution would be. And that would be around things like improving the building standards, tightening the building standards for new build. It would be around uh, improvements in energy efficiency and insulation levels in the existing stock. <coughs> it would be looking to take forward some district heating schemes from low-carbon sources where those are cost-effective in particular areas. And it would be de starting to develop the heat pumps market uh, and supply chain through investing in heat pumps probably off the gas grid initially. Um, and there is more of this in the climate change plan than in the draft. So there's kind of more emphasis on some of that to build those supply chains. And, and, and uh, uh, Then there needs to be 
work going on to look at what the longer term solutions might be, and that is to consider, as an example, hydrogen uh, and whether there is potential. Uh, well, there is potential, but is it, what are the public acceptability issues? What are the costs going to be? Um, we need more work to understand that and to pilot that as an approach so that then governments can make decisions in the early first half of the 2020s about what they think that long-term solution might be, whether hydrogen has a role at all or whether it's back to electrification through heat pumps and the extent to which it is district heating. Mm -hmm. um, so there are longer-term decisions that I think we're not in place, not ready to make those decisions on now, but that doesn't mean that there's not things to do in the meantime, which makes sense whatever that long-term mm -hmm. solution w is. So when, when do you expect a decision on that? to be made, when do you expect there to be clarity over where we get that step change and how we get that step change? Because I uh, hear what you're saying, there's more clarity now around the, the low-hanging fruit, the immediate measures that can be taken in the next five to 10 years. But if you're sitting there as a, as a major gas supplier, um, I, I guess you, you would be wanting to know when the trigger point is for a more substantial change in, in the way that we heat yeah. our homes. Well, we, we have, the committee has said that we need that decision, that kind of steer from governments in the first half of the 2020s, so right. by 2025, the earlier the better. But there is other, you know, we can't make that decision now. We have to have that learning phase and demonstrations to go through and understand it better and understand the costs better. Also, if we're going for hydrogen um, as part of the route forward, then that will need to go forward with carbon capture and storage um, because we see um, reformulation of gas would be the route to of natural gas would be the route to production of hydrogen, and for that to be low carbon, it will need carbon capture and storage. So again, that comes back onto the table. That needs to be developed as 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 an option um, going forward for that to be a part of the. You, you don't see the, the route to hydrogen production coming from uh, renewable energy. Effect. It's possible there could be some through through right. that route, but for the scale that we might be talking about and the level of cost, uh, the committee's view to date has been that it's likely to be through reformulation of natural gas. We are doing more work to look at hydrogen though, and we, are, we will produce a report on the hydrogen option in the autumn of this year, where we'll look more detail at what the options are and what the potential cost is, and where, where that hydrogen can be used. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. <clears throat> um, just for clarity, I presume, since C carbon capture is at least five different technologies, we are talking purely about pre-combustion carbon capture rather than post-combustion. In this case, I think that is right. Again, I'll come back to you if I've got that wrong. Thank you. Um, moving on, uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, good morning, uh, Mr Gold. Can uh, I turn to the factor of emissions from transport? Um, the draft... Uh, climate change plan undertakes by 2032 to phase out the need to buy petrol and diesel cars or vans. That's only 14 years from now. Um, you basically say that 60% uh, of sales of cars and vans could be uh, uh, of ULEF, ultra-low emission vehicles, in 2030, and close to 100% by 2035. Um, can you tell us, if for policies to submit and transport, uh, the Transport Nation to ULEF um, transport, would we not need more electric cars also on the road? We need to improve, vastly improve our uh, additional charging points on the roads and uh, in regards to house building, uh, install now, uh, ask uh, builders to uh, install more points in their house building. Would that be the case? Yeah, to achieve those kinds of, that level of ambition, there will be a continuing need <coughs> to invest in the charging network going forward. Now, that is happening, and there have been, I think, some quite significant increases in the number of fast chargers and other, and other chargers that have been available in Scotland in recent years. But that will continue to, to need to continue to develop going forward. Um, if there are opportunities through planning mechanisms um, to have uh, charging um, built in, for, for, for new build um, estates, then again, that may well make sense. That would be, uh, would be worth doing Yeah, now. but should we not be actually telling builders now, look, um, you used to, you, you, you put uh, telephone charging points in your, uh, sorry, telephone points in your houses, you've put in uh, uh, my satellite and, and, and Wi-Fi, can you now install um, charging points for electric vehicles in, in new house building? Yeah, I should don't that no, not be a condition? I don't think the committee has come to that and said that as yet. 
it seems to me like Give you something to think a about, very yeah. likely thing that would be sensible and should be required. Right, can I move on? Um, I have a diesel motor, a car. So if you want to encourage me to change, um, should you... Uh, should a government or anyone provide interest-free loans? Should we, how are we going to convince people to change? And um, do you think that basically it's going to be feasible that we will reach our target by 2032 to have all uh, to make people change? So the Scottish government's 2032 target goes beyond the ambition that the committee had set out, which is more stretching than the UK government has, has, has gone for. Um, is it feasible? Yes, I think it is feasible to, to achieve that on that timetable uh, with, with policy effort to back that up. And that will be partly through the charging network, um, not just the availability of that network, but also the communication to people about that network and what, what is required and, and what that involves. So reassuring people um, about that capability. Um, it will need a continuation of um, grants, or which is which is available for uh, new purchase of uh, electric cars and vans. That will need to continue, whilst those electric cars and vans are more expensive than the conventional alternative. Now we see in our work that by the early 2020s, the costs of electric vans and car cars, electric cars in particular become absolutely cost competitive with the conventional alternative when you look at the life cycle, you take account of the running costs. So we're not in that position now, and, and, and so long as they do continue to be more expensive, they'll, they, we need to continue with that, that grant or similar mechanism to encourage the purchase. And last question, and I know you don't have a crystal ball. Would you agree with me that we would also have to encourage um, either governments or charging uh, to ensure that the cost of charging an electric vehicle is substantially lower than putting fuel in the vehicle? We need to maintain that position, yes, where the costs are lower. Um, the upfront cost of the vehicle is higher than the conventional alternative. To make them cost effective, you're looking at that lower um, fuel cost over time. Um, so we, we need to continue that for that, for that to, to, to work. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Alex Riley. Can I just follow on for that and maybe, maybe ask your view in terms of um, what other policies we are, we are able to come up with and, and to what extent it's the carrot and the stack approach. If you take, for example, the Cabinet Secretary gave evidence to this committee and she said that increases in transport demand are driven by the economy. And I can see where that's true in the sense if you take the way that shopping patterns have completely changed and we're now looking much more at online, so lots of uh, vehicles there. Um, sh should companies, for example, is there a way the government can start to put pressure on companies if, if it's the, the economic interests, if it's commercial transport rather than personal transport that's increasing, to actually make that shift towards electric, electric vehicles, etc.? And secondly, the, 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 another area that's talked about is low emission zones within the cities. But what's your experience been in terms of London and the congestion charging? Does congestion charging have a... Uh, has it worked in London? Has it reduced emissions? And is there, is there a, a, a role to play there? Um, on the, the transport demand issue seems to be one that is very important and one to look at further. In the, um, despite the fact that the Scottish Government's plan is now based on um, moving to 100% um, electric sales basically by 2032, which is faster than our trajectory, um, despite that the level of transport emissions in 2032 in the climate change plan is, is above the level that we have in our in our scenario. So I don't, at this moment, understand exactly why that has happened. Um, I would have expected it to be a bit lower than our scenario, um, unless it's a reflection of a higher level of transport demand, a higher level than we have in our scenario. So I think there's further work for us to be looking at that. Um, 
Yes, to an extent, clearly, um, transport demand is very dependent on income growth. There is a long-established relationship there. Um, but I think we'd have to do further work to look at how that can be affected and how you can affect that, both through uh, <coughs> work on um, individual um, travel planning and, and with business um, to reduce those demands. So I think there is a role. There's a relatively small amount of that modal sh that, that shift that occur that is in our scenarios, um, and I'd be quite keen to look a bit further at how much of that there is in the Scottish Climate Change Plan, because I think that may be an explanation of that higher level of emissions in their plan compared to our scenario. The the, lo the um, emission zones, um, London. Uh, I don't have the figures. I'm sorry, but I think the London scheme has been quite successful in. Um, reducing the level of traffic and reducing the emissions because of the incentives that has provided um, to electric vehicles or low emission vehicles. Um, and we also see similar levels of success if you look at some other countries in terms of what they have achieved. So I think Norway has the highest level of um, electric vehicles in their new car sales, substantially higher than the couple of percent that the UK has currently reached. And partly that is down to tax issues and partly it is down to local incentives that have been provided to uh, use, um, to, to allow, for example, lower cost parking or the use of um, bus lanes. So there's those kinds of mechanisms that can be used to provide kind of softer incentives um, to encourage take up of electric vehicles. And can I quickly come in there just raise a couple of questions on in terms of cycling. The cycling action plan seeks to deliver an 8% increase in everyday journeys by 2020. Um, is that ambitious enough? Uh, I may say to myself, is it, is it realistic? Um, and where is it joined up? Government needed in terms of that, because to increase cycling, in, say, a city like Edinburgh, the capital city of Scotland, where it's like an assault course to try and drive along the roads, never mind be on a bike, just seems that there is, there is... Do you need more joined up thinking around that? And it's back to the, the question, I think, that, that Angus raised earlier about taking people with us. If you, if you look at the press this last... A uh, number of weeks in Scotland, cyclists more than anybody are talking about the state of the roads, in particular in the cities, and it's not safe to go on a bike. So, so is that realistic? And, and do we need more joined up thinking? And do we need to actually start to engage more with people, in this instance, cyclists, to talk about what the issues are? So, my understanding is that the proportion of trips that are, that are um, uh, taken by cycling currently is. Uh, is very low, it's, it's a couple of percent. It's nowhere near the ambition of the targets. So is that target high enough? I can't say to you whether it's high enough, but all I can say is we're nowhere near achieving even that target at this point. So that would suggest that there are a number of barriers to that achievement going forward. Um, and I think there, you, you, you know, the nature of it would be you would have to think about a whole host of different issues and, and be joined up across sectors and uh, the different issues which we include the state of the road um, and so on but when you look at particular cities the, you know there are examples where substantial amount has been achieved so there's there clearly ought to be some learning that ought to be able to go on as to how that has been achieved in those particular areas um, and what that means for edinburgh or for wherever else okay thank you john scott briefly Oh, thank you, convener. Can I just very briefly invite you to explore the, the thought of, of, in terms of modal shift and the practicalities of getting people onto bikes from cars and the reality might well be that people might move to buses uh, more readily given the state of the roads um, and given the ageing profile of our community, um, myself included. Um, and, and as someone who's a recipient of a bus pass, I've gone from being a point-to-point -point person in a car to totally uh, enjoying travelling on buses as, as, a, as a new way of moving around. And I think that could be encouraged. Have you, would you like to talk around that and, and how that might actually be the solution for low emission zones in, in cities, particularly in Scotland and indeed elsewhere? Yeah, so 
I want to go back on the cycling issue. So without in any sense downplaying the importance of, of trying to shift towards more cycling, um, the journeys that are potentially going to be shifted are, are probably the, the shortest journeys. So there may be a significant proportion of journeys, but they're probably a relatively small proportion of overall carbon and transport carbon. There's potential, I think, for the greater shift in terms of carbon emissions to be made through modal shift towards buses, which is, you know, it can take a higher proportion of the journeys and a higher proportion of the carbon potentially could, could be, could be uh, reduced through, through that kind of mechanism. Okay. Thank you. Mark Roscoe. Um, just to perhaps finalise this, this theme, though, around walking and cycling, um, I mean, we have quite a clear route map to achieving very high cycle rates, and we just need to look at, you know, Netherlands, Denmark, major cities. Um, I just wonder what, where the gap is. Do you see a, a kind of a blueprint there for how you develop very high rates of walking and cycling, particularly in, in cities across Europe? And is there a gap between what we have in Scotland and across the UK uh, and what they have elsewhere. And, and also, is it best to build this up from city action plans up, up the way, or does it require a national policy working uh, from the top down as well as from the bottom up? Um, I suspect that those local plans are going to be very important. That doesn't mean you couldn't have some kind of national ambition and guidance, but I suspect that bottom up at the local level is going to be very important because the issues are going to be different in different localities. But I would have thought there's a lot to learn from the areas and the, co the countries and cities where there has been success in this area. Um, but I do come back to the point that I wouldn't want to get too hung up on the cycling issue <coughs> in terms of the carbon benefits, because I think in the end it will be a relatively small proportion of the transport emissions that can be shifted. Um, there may be huge benefits from this shift for other reasons as well, which are to, to do with health benefits and so on. Um, but um, I suspect that the proportion of the carbon that can be shifted is relatively small. But is it cost effective? Yes, it probably is cost effective. I mean, you've, you've got to More invest cost in... effective than investment in EVs or...? Um, uh, no, you should invest in both to the extent that they're cost effective. Um, compared to our, our kind of assessment of what's needed to meet the future targets. Mm -hmm. But I think you can't rely on it to achieve anywhere near the level of decarbonisation that the shift towards mm -hmm. electric vehicles is going to achieve. OK, thank you. Uh, moving on, Stuart Stevens. Uh, thank you, and let me start by uh, drawing attention to my register of interest, which shows I have shares in a local wind farm. Uh, to give context, that gives me an income of £36 a year. Uh, but nonetheless, it's appropriate to declare it, um, because I want to talk about industry. Um, how, uh, in particular, does the uh, proposed 21% uh, reduction in the sector uh, to 2032 compare with the committee's scenarios? Um, I think it is a little below our scenarios going forward. Um, but not, so yeah, a little below, but not hugely below. Um, but it relies on a number of mechanisms that are largely, um, in particular the EU ETS, which is, which is not within um, uh, the Scottish Government's control going forward. Um, I think longer term there is a question, and there's some energy efficiency improvement within there as well. Um, longer term there's still an issue about carbon capture and storage and there's necessity for that um, to be meeting the uh, 2050 targets. Um, Decarbonising in industry in the longer term is going to require that kind of mechanism. Um. Are you implying that you see carbon capture and storage applying to industry beyond the power generation? Because I think previous contributions you've made have suggested that, in essence, um, combustion as part of power generation will no. be all but eliminated I'm by 2050. certainly seeing carbon capture and storage as necessary for industry in the long term. So, in a sense, you can almost see decarbonisation of the power sector 
happening could happen without much contribution of carbon capture and storage. But decarbonisation of industry or substantial decarbonisation, which will be needed to meet the long-term targets, is going to require carbon capture and storage. I mean, certainly in the committee's work and the work of others like the Energy Technologies Institute, the, the costs of meeting the 2050 target are doubled without, the overall cost across the economy are doubled without carbon capture and storage um, compared to having capture and storage. And that's largely <coughs> an industry issue. Uh, I made in my previous intervention some reference to the different technologies. Have you looked at the economics now? Of course, it's an immature technology, so I understand the difficulties in doing this. But clearly, at the moment, a lot of focus has been on retrofitting power stations, but that, I think, has gone off agenda. <coughs> Building new power stations would be quite different, but also the different technologies that apply to different parts of industrial processes. To what extent has the committee done any research on that? And do you have any conclusions you can share with us? So we done quite a lot of work on carbon capture and storage and what I would do is send you um, a, a link if I may to to the relevant work we've looked substantially at the issue um, we made suggestions to the UK government about how this could be taken forward <coughs> which were largely consistent with the review that I think Lord Oxburgh um, conducted on capture and storage um, so Clearly, there is a cost to carbon capture and storage, mm -hmm. which you can't avoid. Um, but there is an issue about, um, for us, there is an issue that we've seen through deployment, for example, of offshore wind. <coughs> but that process has brought the cost down very substantially. And our view is that that same kind of cost reduction is likely if we were to look at deployment of carbon capture and storage. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Moving on to another facet, my colleague uh, ref brought in the EU ETS, so let me just uh, move on from his question a little bit. We, we, we've seen international trading, for example, between uh, Japan and Latvia in 2009, <coughs> uh, Japan and the Ukraine, and some other international trades. Uh, so does that suggest that really the UK post-Brexit doesn't really need to be forced to be in the EU ETS, uh, although there may be administrative advantages in doing so, that it will be able to, if it chooses to do so, to buy and sell in international markets which are beginning to develop. Um, there may be potential to link to other schemes which are beginning to develop, and China is developing mm -hmm. schemes, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but we see, in principle, advantages <coughs> of the trading mechanism through the EU ETS. Um, is that simply because the EU ETS is probably the biggest scheme in the world at this present time? At, at this time, yes. Um, and then there are issues there that the EU ETS could link to, to other schemes going forward. So there are advantages in being part of a bigger market. Um, so if we're not part of the EU ETS, it would be for the governments to decide about what the, what the mechanisms might be used to maintain some kind of trading role going forward. Um, in the long term, our view has always been that the emission reductions ought to be achieved domestically you know, rather than relying on trading. So trading may have a role in smoothing the cost and reducing the cost of the transition. But in the end, everybody's got to get their emissions down um, very substantially. And we have net zero in the second half of the century. So trading is likely to be a part of getting to net zero as well. Um, so in terms of the removal technologies, it is likely that some countries may have greater potential and advantages than some others. So there may be a degree of trading there. But the UK focus for the long term should be on how we reduce our emissions. Um, without thinking that we can buy out um, through trading, which at the moment we would expect to be very expensive in the longer term, given the, the requirements for everybody to be reducing their emissions. Um, I'm encouraged by your attitude to trading. Let me just post that. Um, the, 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 the other thing, I suppose, um, just to close this one off, 
is are there any particular opportunities that Scotland is missing out of in industry that's within our competencies uh, to reduce emissions? The answer might be no. Um, I'd come back to thinking further about carbon capture and storage and the potential for grange mouth or other you know, clusters of industry and how that would relate to an offshore potential for storage, yep. um, which I know there is a, I think there's a pilot that's currently being funded th yep. from, the, from the government, but that's pretty small scale. The UK government plans are also pretty small scale with a substantial focus on usage at the moment. So for the long term, we have to get carbon capture and storage to reduce those industry emissions. Um, so I think that's an area that needs more focus. Uh, the little um, what's going on is in my constituency, okay. so I'm very interested. Sorry. But And I think uh, we have a huge advantage in that one of the depleted fields uh, was a sour gas field. So the quality of the piping is already uh, suitable for carbonic acid, which most piping isn't. Anyway, can right. we... Yeah. Um, look, looking briefly at opportunities, what potential does blue carbon have for Scotland in this regard? So blue carbon, I'm sorry, is an issue that the committee has not looked at in any substantial detail. So I think it was covered very briefly in our last risk assessment report. Um, but the evidence base when we did look at it, it was very thin. I think it is developing, so I'm sure it's an issue that the committee will come back to. But at the moment, I, I'm, my understanding is that there is potentially a relatively high um, importance for Scotland compared to the rest of the UK, but I, I know really little more than that. So I think it's an issue the committee will come back to in future. Okay, I, d I do hope so, and I think yeah. my colleague Claudia Beamish certainly hopes so. <laughs> is there an area she's taking a particular interest in? Um, can I just br briefly look at the land use uh, sector? We considered earlier the impact of revisions to the baselines that we work to. I'm just wondering how robust the uh, methodology is for calculating emissions from forestry and from peatlands, and whether we should anticipate revisions uh, around the figures there? So we should anticipate that there is the potential for such revisions going forward, absolutely, and we should think about how we plan for that and how we take that into account. But it's difficult to anticipate what the size of those uh, amendments, uh, those revisions might be going forward. So we were asked by the Scottish Government to advise on um, how targets might be amended or, or reconsidered in the light of inventory changes that have occurred. And we wrote to the Scottish Government, I think in December, setting out the co committee's views on that. Um, and that did suggest that rather than, um, that the important thing was to maintain policy effort, um, because it's important to have stability and understanding from those who are taking the, the mitigation forward, understanding what is required. So changes in the inventory could mean either that to meet um, a new, uh, a, the existing target, that could make that, meeting that existing target easier, or it could make it more difficult at very late notice. Um, the committee's view was that policy efforts should not be increased or reduced because of that, but rather it would be better to assess progress against um, a kind of adjusted emissions inventory that was consistent with the emissions inventory at the time that the target was set, um, and then after a five-year period, reconsider the accumulation of those inventory changes over that entire period and think about whether that meant that the targets should be revised or amended, because in the long run, the targets need to be consistent with the science. But we shouldn't expect kind of year-to-year -year variations in policy effort as a re result of these, these variations in inventory, but we should have a mechanism that allows for those targets to be amended in the longer term. Okay. Looking specifically at forestry, although Scotland has presented a, a, a plant, I think it's 70 per cent of the trees that have been planted in the UK over the period of RPP2, um, I think the average was still only 6,007 hectares per year. We now need to move to an average over the next 10-year period between, well, between 2012 and 2022 20, uh, of, of uh, 
10,000 hectares on average every year. I'm just wondering how the committee views the measures that are in place to try and deliver on that. I mean, things like the forestry grant scheme that's been introduced and other measures. Is it viable um, to, that we're going to uh, hit these targets? And I think that the target goes up beyond that 10,000 mm -hmm. hectares. It goes to 15,000 yep. in, yeah. in the longer term. So, um, and that is consistent with the committee's view about what is necessary um, going forward. So yes, we do think it is viable to achieve that. I don't have an exact answer, I'm sorry for you, as to whether the plans that have been set out will be sufficient to, to achieve that. But it will clearly need a substantial policy effort and support for that uh, afforestation going forward. So we think it's an appropriate level of ambition. Okay, but you're not yet sure if it's achievable. Well, we think or it, it is achievable. achievable. We think Sorry. it is achievable. But will it be achieved? Will it be achieved unclear? with the current policy? We haven't done that full assessment yet. Okay, right. Well, turning to agriculture, John Scott. Um, thank you very much. And just finishing off on that question, I mean, it'd be fair to say there's a there's a deal of antipathy within agricultural circles towards planting, and I'm not certain if the measures that are in place sufficiently will encourage. How, how do we balance that? need for more forestry, for more timber and the sequestration that provides against the need for food production, if you like. Um, we're, we're doing a bit of further work at the committee currently on land use change and what might be required going forward. Um, and that would be trying to look at how we balance the, some of the, that would include within it, some, some balancing that need for afforestation and the need for food production um, and the need potentially for, for bioenergy crops. So there are significant issues there about that balance. Um, how we, we need, you know, we need to do that thinking about the cost effective potential in, in different areas. Um, also, if we need to get to net zero emissions, and that is sorry, a committed target, then we're going to need these, um, these kinds of technologies, um, the negative emission technologies. So there's got to be a substantial role, I think, going forward for appropriate um, uh, forestation and for, for example, use of wood in construction. Um, so I'm not sure that probably doesn't answer entirely your question. No, I think it's probably one of these imponderables. Um, thank you very much. Um, can I also ask you, in terms of agriculture directly, why do you think there has been so little progress in that sector um, to date? Um, do you think it's to do with profitability or a lack of knowledge or other things? Um, I suspect it's an issue that is connected with profitability and... Um, uh, and lack of knowledge, and it's connected with a voluntary approach, um, which is encouraging those who have the greatest commitment to be, uh, who are the, they're the like ones who are likely to take it up. But we haven't seen um, a reduction in, in agriculture emissions in Scotland, as I understand it, for about the last six, seven years. I mean, they're pretty flat. So it would appear that that voluntary approach is not working to date. Um, so I think that's the kind of question mark for my committee is about whether actually thought should be given to, a, to moving towards a more regulated approach that would still retain elements of information. It's got to uh, retain elements about information exchange and availability. But whether there are actually, whether there's actually a requirement to move towards something which is uh, not a voluntary approach, which is either compulsory or is incentivised in other ways. Would you accept, or notwithstanding, that, that the sophistication of, of food production now is a, quite a refined process, and therefore the need to, to when you start interfering with these maximised food production systems, simply to try and maximise profitability, there's a huge difficulty in moving towards carbon reduction as well. Um, and I honestly think that there's a need for much more knowledge transfer. Uh, committee, um, representatives, committees, the, this committee have in fact in, in recent times suggested that while the knowledge is there, the, the, the 
the livestock and the agricultural, the cropping industry is not entirely aware of A, what's expected of them and B, how to achieve that. Um, would you say that's a fair comment? Um, that may well be a fair comment, but there have been schemes um, um, in Scotland ab about provision of information. So I think you then have a question about, well, if that is fair comment, why are those schemes not working? Why are they not working at scale? So those schemes need to be evaluated. And if they're not producing that, the results, then I think we have to consider what are the alternatives and how do we go beyond that. And information provision will still be a part of the answer, but maybe it needs incentivisation through other routes. And we're talking about farmers maximising uh, their profitability. But if we're not taking account of the social costs within that profitability decision, then, then you know, they're not coming to the decisions or judgments that overall are appropriate for, for society as a whole. So I think we need to bring those more into line, and that's just moving towards other mechanisms to incentivise those abatement uh, measures, and not just to rely on a voluntary approach. And I sense I know the answer to this question, but given the tone of what you've just said, that do you think the government, the Scottish government, is is incorrect in in reducing the targets from agricultural sector from twelve down to nine percent? Um, I think that this is an area where the government sh should be looking at the potential to increase those targets, not to reduce those reduction targets. That may well need other incentive mechanisms to produce the results. Um, but agriculture emissions in Scotland are 20%, I think, of the overall total, maybe slightly higher than that. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, an area that really needs to be examined about what the potential is to be contributing towards the long-term reductions. 17%, I think, is the figure for okay, agriculture. 20% in my head, but there you are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so would you like to just to speculate on what alternatives then the government should consider to, to help deliver the bigger reductions? So I think that previously, for example, the Scottish Government has said it was going to uh, introduce compulsory um, testing of the soils um, uh, for uh, pH and potentially for other nutrients. And I think it's moved away from that, so that is again an issue to come back to. And that, that if there was compulsory testing, then that would then um, provide greater information for nutrient management that farmers could use. There were then questions about whether um, payments to, to farmers um, um, can be reformed to encourage um, the uptake of mitigation measures. Um, and we have that opportunity um, through Brexit. This is one of the areas where there may be an opportunity to reform the payments system to encourage um, greater level of mitigation effort by farmers. Uh, are there any standout things that occur to you that might be worth doing, particularly? What would be worth doing is looking at fertiliser use and the most effective and efficient use of fertilisers. Um, and this may be good for the farmer as well, mm -hmm. um, longer term, but, um, but, but looking at mechanisms to uh, incentivise the appropriate use of fertilisers. Um, I don't have an exact um, policy recommendation for you. Um, but there is potential, I think, there for that to be potentially reasonable, good for the farmers uh, in the long term, but also good for reduction of emissions. For my part, I prefer to see the voluntary approach continue, but I have to speak from a position of self-interest there, but um, openly. But would you agree that a voluntary approach in the longer term is still better than a regulatory approach? Um, a, a voluntary approach, if it delivered the emission savings, it w w would be excellent. So I think it's important to evaluate the current voluntary approach. I'm not aware that there is a substantial evaluation as yet. I think there has been work going on with the Scottish Government to look at what has been achieved. So you could say that the next step would be to let's have, a look, let's have a serious look at what that approach has delivered. If we look simply at the level of agricultural emissions, it doesn't appear to have delivered very much but there may be things that we can learn through that voluntary approach that you'd still want to retain. Thank you so much. Very briefly, Mark Roscoe. And over this issue of a voluntary approach, in particular to, to soil testing, has there been active discussion about the, the policy here? Um, there's been discussion... Uh, I, I, I don't know what discussions there have been within the teams, but clearly 
it is there within our past recommendations and our past advice to Scottish Government in terms of our pros report um, and in terms of past UK pros reports, there's been advice on the need to move beyond the voluntary approach. Were you given reasons why it was rejected to take a statutory approach? I to don't self think we, I'm not aware that we've been given reasons as to why that was rejected. Um, but we can see the climate change plan and, 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 uh, and see what reasons have been given for that approach going forward. OK, and just to wrap this up, let's look to the future and uh, the climate change bill that's coming down the track. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, during your earlier contributions, you've identified a number of areas where Scotland could do bigger things than perhaps the UK. Um, the most recent one you mentioned was the distant prospect of blue carbon. Are there other areas uh, where the 2050 targets that uh, we would expect to be incorporated in the new climate change bill could be more ambitious than the rest of the UK? And why, if so? Um, so Scotland um, can go further in terms of the contribution of afforestation. It can look at the contribution of wood in construction, where it already has substantially higher um, uh, level of wood construction than I think the rest of the UK. Um, it, it has ambitions which are more, it's more ambitious on moving towards electric vehicles um, and um, potentially it could look at how, how to go further than it, its current plan on decarbonisation of heat. Um, now um, Scotland I think has a slightly higher proportion of buildings off the gas grid than the UK. And those are areas that may be re um, it may be appropriate to go relatively earlier and faster in terms of decarbonisation um, through, for example, through, through move towards heat pumps. Um, and there is potential to go further and faster on energy efficiency improvement. Um, and Scotland has ambitious plans in, in that area. Um, I, I speak as someone who is off-grid and whose uh, spouse has researched heat pumps and wanted to go there, but having established that the nearest servicing engineer was two and a half hours' drive away, uh, has uh, decided not to proceed on that basis. And I think, I think actually that is actually one of the big issues in getting off-grid people, the lack of support, whereas the uh, oil, um, the nearest engineer, is six miles away and can be summoned very readily. So I think there's a, there are broader policy issues, but I, that's just an observation and really shouldn't particularly form this. Can I move on to um, net emissions accounting and just uh, uh, the, the, how, how will that help us uh, in future in... Uh, in, in terms of dealing with event, inventory revisions in particular. Do you mean the, the, the move towards um, measuring just the, the gross emissions? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, I think it helps in the, term, in the sense of clarity of what is being aimed at. Um, it's, uh, it's very difficult, I think, to explain um, the concept of the net emissions accounting. Um, so in terms of clarity of targets going forward, I think it helps in terms of explaining what those targets are and the measures that need to be in place to achieve that. Um, and it is consistent with the need in the long term to get emissions down domestically rather than using trading. Um, it introduces some complexities in, in the sense that um, by moving away from that approach, um, there might be more pressure on industry to reduce emissions um, rather than trading um, through, out uh, at lower cost, potentially. So um, in moving towards gross emissions accounting, you need, need to be careful um, that those, the measures expected of, of industry are, are not going to be at excessive cost or that there are compensation mechanisms available to deal with those industry costs. Um, 
because you don't want to be imposing higher costs than, the, than, than countries with which we are internationally uh, trading. Uh, but nonetheless, given your previous remarks about the undesirability of depending to a significant degree on trading, it would be appropriate for industry to be focusing on its actual emissions rather than netting it off by other mechanisms. Yeah, we came to the conclusion that it was um, appropriate and it was a sensible way forward to switch towards that gross accounting basis. But that doesn't rule out the use of trading as a mechanism, um, but it does mean we just need to be alive to those competitiveness implications. So we think there are ways of dealing with that. Okay, my last contribution before <coughs> our colleagues. Um, just have you talked about the interim targets, in, interim targets for 2030 and 2040 with the government? Um, Yes, in as much as we have advised on the level of the 66% reduction target for 2030, and we've suggested um, an interim target for 2040 that would be consistent with a 90% reduction target for 2050, where 90% was at the limits of what, are, what we currently have within our scenarios about what can be achieved. Convener, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that concludes our questioning for today. Um, Mr Gold, thank you very much for your time. Um, I, I think it was a useful session. I'm going to suspend now briefly to change uh, to the next witness panel. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The third item on the agenda is to take evidence on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill at Stage 1. This morning we will focus on stakeholders who are directly affected by management of Crown Estate assets. I therefore welcome 
Patricia Hawthorne from Scottish Renewables, David Sanderson from the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation, Mark Simmons from the British Ports Authority, and Dr Alan Wells of the Fisheries Management Scotland. Good morning to you all, and we'll move straight to questions. Um, John Scott. Thank you very much, convener. Um, good morning, and thank you for coming, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I note the diverse range of backgrounds from which you come. Um, what are your experiences of the Crown Estate and the Crown Estate Scotland? Um, and what, in your view, makes for good estate management? Discuss. Dr Wells. <laughs> um, from our perspective, uh, we have quite a wide-ranging set of uh, um, um, discussions with the Crown Estate. So the Crown Estate own about 140 salmon fisheries across Scotland. They sit on uh, several district salmon fishery boards who are, who are our members. Uh, so we have a close, close relationship with them in terms of the management of wild fisheries. But we also work with the Crown Estate uh, in relation to salmon farming, in relation to marine renewables and other developments in the marine environment. So, uh, for example, we're working with Crown Estate at the moment on, uh, on identifying and, and, and assessing methods of monitoring potential impacts on wild fish uh, w with regard to the Aquaculture Stewardship Council certification for, for fish farms and also with regard to environmental management plans which are coming through from planning on, uh, on um, through the planning process for salmon farming. Uh, we also work uh, with Crown Estate on marine renewable uh, leases and uh, I've done quite a lot of work on, again, looking at the impacts potentially of marine renewables and offshore wind farms on, uh, on migratory salmon and sea trout. Thank you. Do others have experiences? Patricia Good morning. Um, perhaps I could just say at the start that I'm here in my capacity as a director of Scottish Renewables, but I am also a partner in law firm uh, Shep and Wedderburn, and we do act for a number of offshore developers, both tidal and uh, offshore wind. So just to make the committee aware of that, um, I'm happy to answer questions from both perspectives, but primarily I am here speaking for Scottish Renewables this morning. Um, the engagement we have with uh, Crown Estate is, is largely as, as landlords in the offshore uh, sector, offshore wind and, and marine uh, wave and tidal projects. Um, I have, uh, in anticipation of the day, spoken with a number of members and I think the description that the Crown Estate mm -hmm. offered up for themselves in, in relation to uh, their involvement with renewables, which is as a a landlord, a catalyst, and a supportive partner is, is, would broadly be echoed by the industry, um, by most of our members. Uh, the relationship is, is triggered by the lease process, uh, but the Crown Estate has been obviously influential in bringing forward licensing rounds for development of projects, and in also um, participating in helping deliver the project, so it, that supportive role has been quite important. Uh, and that has uh, ranged from everything for, from participating in consultations, but also helping to fund and manage enabling works in the early stages of the projects. So broadly speaking, our engagement is, is through that landlord and tenant context, um, but the relationship is, is probably a bit wider than that in actual fact. And that positive relationship you've had in the past, you would expect to see continuing into the future? Yes. Broadly speaking, it has been a positive relationship. It has been a reasonably effective and efficient management process. David Sanderson. Hello. Uh, likewise, um, our relationship with the Crown Estate is mainly as our landlord. Um, we have a significant number of seabed leases around the uh, coastline of Scotland and um, that has developed over rapidly over many years in terms of our needs in terms of the scale of sites that we require for, for our industry to move forward and that's been a productive relationship between the landlords and tenants uh, 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 over that time so um, it, it, that is that is the fundamental relationship and clearly we we look upon the Crown Estate as, some, as a body that has supported our, our plans for development over the years. Mark Simmons. Uh, well, we represent the uh, overwhelming majority of uh, ports in Scotland and uh, most of our members' engagement with the Crown Estate is um, as uh, the Crown Estate obviously own most of the seabed and um, 
our members in, in, in carrying out their statutory duties have to uh, work with the Crown Estate on uh, leases and uh, licenses for things like uh, dredging and, and uh, maintaining navigable channels um, in fulfilment of their statutory duties. Um, I would say that's not all of our members have always found that to be the easiest process has uh, sometimes been uh, difficult or time consuming and has at times added to development costs or taken taken uh, added delays to, to that process so it's it's not always been been the easiest so uh, to answer your question uh, what would be uh, what would be good in terms of a management process um, responsiveness uh, working with uh, the users of of the assets um, and um, making sure it remains affordable as our members obviously can't move elsewhere they have to uh, work with the manager that of that asset. Okay. Can I just be clear, are you reflecting the view across the UK of, of dealings with the Crown Estate or is that specific to Scotland and is there a difference? Um, that was across the, well, it's it's quite a similar experience um, mm. it, it, that, that we found, but um, I'm, I'm here speaking on behalf of our Scottish members. No, I just ask because I'm interested in whether, in, in, as we move to Crown Estate Scotland, you, you're identifying an opportunity, or from your point of view, where things could be done better. There, there is definitely an opportunity to do things better, yes. Um, it remains to be seen whether that will be taken. But the, the type of delays that are, that are your members are confronted with, are, are they because of environmental concerns? local concerns what does it tend to be or is it just the process that's that's come quite often just the process in that um, extending leases or getting licenses for uh, activities that, as i say are statutory responsibilities of our members okay thank you moving on claudia beamish uh, thank you Vin. good morning to you all and could i just go back to you um alan wells just briefly to ask you about what your perception of good management in relation to your interface with the crown estates is and whether you see that as positive in the past or positive going forward or whatever. Do you have any comment, please? I think generally speaking, it has been positive, but um, because we're dealing with the Crown Estate across a range of issues, probably the experience is different in those, uh, in those different issues. So uh, with regard to the salmon fish, fishing, so we, we, we've had a very positive uh, relationship with the Crown Estate. Um, generally speaking, the Crown Estate lease those fishings to, to, to angling clubs, occasionally to private owners, but uh, very often it's to angling clubs. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier on, they, 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 they participate on the District Salmon Fishery Boards. Um, we are in favour of, uh, of, of, those, uh, of the management of those fisheries being devolved further. I think uh, we, can, we, we could potentially see a lot of benefit in that, not so much from an economic perspective, but from a wider environmental and social perspective in terms of encouraging access to those fishings and uh, getting more people fishing, which is a, a, an issue for our sector. Um, with regard to uh, salmon farming, I, I think Crown Estate probably takes much more of a, 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 a landlord type, type, type approach, as, as was discussed earlier on. Um, they're one of a number of, of, of elements of the regulatory system, and the committees obviously looked at that previously. So I think there's all sorts of scope for, for bringing that system together and having a much more sort of... Uh, um, coherent system of, of, of regulation and, and I think Crown Estate, the, the, the Crown Estate role has, has a role to play there but from a sort of interactions perspective we've been involved in several projects with the Crown Estate uh, on that and they've all been very positive from our perspective. Um, again with marine renewables we were involved in a project up on the north coast in relation to the major end development. The Crown Estate put some uh, uh, support into uh, into helping to get people around the table on that project, and uh, again, it was uh, it, it, it was positive. But one of the things I think that we would quite like to see through the through the bill is is perhaps a greater emphasis on sustainable development rather than necessarily on on, on economic development, as has been the case in the past. Okay. Right, Shall I continue? Yeah. Uh, which does actually. Um, uh, let me reassure the general public and everybody this was not a planned <laughs> question leading on from, from Alan Wells to, to turn to environmental protection very specifically in relation to the bill, which is something that our committee and the previous committee have taken a strong interest in, in terms of mission statements and perhaps the bill is an opportunity to clarify some of those issues. Um, and as you will know, the bill sets out that managers of assets must maintain an and seek to enhance the value of assets and the income arising. And, 
but may, and I stress the word may, do so in a way which contributes to the wider objectives, including environmental well-being. We had a submission from uh, Professor Ross and Professor Reid, um, and that suggests that the bill could be amended to require managers to take considerations, um, these considerations into account um, in clause seven, so a clear subsection two. Um, and they also point out um, that sustainable development encompasses, as we all know, environmental, social, and economic well-being. So I wonder if any of the panel uh, can comment on uh, whether it would be valuable to change the May to require and any other comments in relation to environmental protection in the bill. Mark Simmons. Um, I'm not entirely, this might not be a popular view, but I'm not entirely sure that would be necessary because any activity that you undertake that has an impact on the environment or any development, already need, you already need to prove that uh, in the licensing process. So I'm not sure that would uh, add an awful lot other than um, replicating what, what, what developers already do. Right. I think, just to clarify, I think the point is perhaps that within um, the Crown Estates, it's um, the, uh, the value of the assets and the income arising, which is the important, uh, more generic issue, and whether sustainable development um, should, uh, there should be an obligation to take that into account in, uh, while moving forward with, with the business plan or whatever from the, from the bill. So it's, I think it's... Yeah, oh yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's slightly different. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, it's, yeah. it, that's fair enough comment, yes, in terms of actual applications, yes, mm. but it's more the broader issue, I think. Any other comments? Um, just move along the panel, Alan Wells. Uh, I think that would be a, a, a useful addition. Um, I think uh, that Professor Ross and Professor Reid mentioned the, a similar duty in the Climate Change Bill. There's also a, a, a similar duty in the, the Marine Scotland Bill from 2010, uh, which basically says in exercising any function that affects the Scottish Marine area, Scottish ministers and public authorities must act in the best way calculated to further the achievement of sustainable development. So I think it's consistent with the approach that we take in other legislation. It'd be good to see that in there. Thank you. I, I don't think we would uh, have any fundamental objection to sustainability being part of any decision-making process, certainly in the renewables context. I have to say, looking at the uh, bill, I don't think that was the intention of putting that clause in. I think it did have another purpose, and um, it was about weighing the balance uh, and whether uh, you were able to move away from that uh, value judgment. That's how I read it anyway, in conjunction with Clause 11. But... Um, I would have to agree with, with Mark that I think there are other regulatory controls that are focused specifically on sustainability and environmental protection, and it's about getting all the forms of regulation to sit comfortably with one another, to respect one another, but not all to be looking at the same thing. I, I, I don't think we'd be fundamentally opposed to it, but I'm not convinced it's necessary. David I think we would hold a similar view in terms of whether or not there's a necessity for such a clause. Um, I think um, we would like to see as many opportunities taken as possible for good alignment with other regulatory regimes. And clearly there's a number of regulatory regimes that apply in the marine context. Alignment with the national planning and marine planning and the fact that um, there are, there's already significant environmental protection regulation uh, out there applying to our activities. What we'd like to see is a bringing together of the planning functions and the Crown estate leasing functions in a, in a, in a, a as cohesive a way as possible to make that beneficial to all. Cool. And um, from that point of view, I don't think we'd have any particularly strong views about whether or not that, that's a, a requirement or not. I, 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 I don't think I'm making clear what the, the question is, perhaps, because uh, the, the point is about um, the actual assets of the Crown Estate and whether, um, as managers of the assets, they, they um, obviously have the very serious responsibility to maintain and seek to enhance the value of those assets. Um, and the income arising. Would it, in that context of, of that requirement, which is there in reserved issues and, and will no doubt transfer uh, at the point of, of um, devolution, is, is there, should there be an obligation uh, as well for the Crown Estates to look at that in relation to their, their decisions on assets, rather than regulation? I'm now being clear, I hope. <laughs> and you've thrown them. <laughs> Alan Wells. Maybe just give an example that might 
help with that. One Thank of the you. examples <laughs> that we, uh, we, we raised was the, the, the salmon fishings. Now, the, the salmon fishings are largely in the central belt. Um, they tend to be on, on rivers that aren't necessarily of, of, of high value in comparison with some of the rivers that we have in Scotland. And therefore, trying to get you know, a huge amount of economic value from those fisheries is maybe not not necessarily the best way. There's a, there's another route which is actually looking at getting a, a great deal more sort of social and uh, and uh, environmental benefit from those from those fisheries. So getting people using them, getting people out in the outdoors and all the rest of it, and and maybe putting less emphasis on actually getting a, 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 an economic benefit from those fisheries. Any other comments on that, David Sanderson? I think I'm getting where you're going with this one, and that's that's quite Sarah, interesting. Sarah. No, I, I, I tend to feel that you may be um, pushing it slightly open door. I, I tend to agree with Alan that there's there's more than just the economic value that can be accrued from from the Crown Estate, and we should be looking at the wider socio-economics of, of of that relationship. So I think I think there is an opening there for things to be to be widened out, perhaps. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The this committee has all previously expressed a view in the context of its salmon inquiry on the regulatory approach um, around aquaculture, so let's not revisit that. But specifically, um, how might the Crown Estate's role in aquaculture consenting change? When we heard from the SSPO of a view that they hold. Um, but I, I'm just wondering uh, what advantages and dis disadvantages might such a change uh, provide for the industry for the local communities and perhaps most importantly of all the marine environment. David Sanderson. Um, I think we've said that um, we can see an opportunity here for better alignment from the process of how you go about uh, 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 getting to a point of having a lease and, and the various permissions that you need to carry out your activity. Um, I think there needs to be good alignment and I'm not saying that that's not been the case, but there's an opportunity when we bring things into a, a, a purely Scottish context and certainly looking at how that might be devolved further, that those things could be even better aligned than they are at the moment. And that would be a great benefit at a time when we're looking overall at the regulatory environment and finding that sometimes regulation does have to change and does have to be um, reviewed and, and brought into, into, into something which is a better fit for what uh, the, the, the modern industries that are using the, the Crown Estate assets would, 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 would like to see. I get why that would be helpful for the industry, absolutely, and, and one could argue for local communities perhaps, but what about the marine environment? How would it benefit that? Um, I think it's, it's definitely the case that at, at, a, at, a, at a regional or community level, we need to have a, a, a view about what the benefits to the wider community in terms of environmental protection can be across the wide, wide range of different uses of that environment. And um, in terms of enhancing marine spatial planning, regional planning, and bringing in the environmental scrutiny required for that process and aligning it to the Crown Estate leasing process, we can, we can achieve that. Okay, thanks. Alan Wells. Maybe give, a, a, again, a couple of specific examples, but um, I would preface this by saying that I think it probably should be looked at in, in the round with, with, with the other elements. But for example, um, through the, the strategic uh, fish health strategy that's taking place at the moment, one of the things that's been looked at or will be looked at going forward are the areas, the, the management areas in which uh, salmon farming takes place. Now, if you change the, 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 those areas that you could see an advantage in having fire breaks for, for, for want of a better way of putting it between different areas so you don't get read across. So you actually you could use the, the leasing to say we're not going to lease in those areas to, in order to create those fire breaks and to keep them in place. Another example might be, for example, if, uh, if, if it was found in future that a, a, a farm was not um, located necessarily in the right place, then you might, you might take the decision not to, not to renew the lease in that area. But obviously, you need to look at these things with it, within the wider regulatory um, regime. OK. Mark Roscoe, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Just turning now to um, transferred or delegated management, um, I mean, it was interesting in the consultation that clearly some different views on the ability of sectors to be involved with communities or, or by themselves in uh, managing or, or, you know, having transferred um, responsibilities. I'm just wondering how the environment gets safeguarded in, in that situation. And perhaps if I could start with Mark Simmons, because you, you, know, you represent ports and harbours. Um, there are 
perhaps issues around harbour's regulator, harbour authorities' regulatory functions, but also their commercial interests. So I'm just wondering, how do you, in terms of governance, how do you actually square those uh, responsibilities? And if you were to take more control of the seabed and add that into your uh, to, to the functions of harbour authorities, how, how, how would those those issues play out? How, how does the environment? Um, stay as a key concern, a key issue within that, if you were to get delegated functions or transfers? Well, um, as, as I said in my previous answer, I imagine that all activities that have an impact on the environment would still be licensable by uh, Marine Scotland or, or whoever else. So um, I don't see that that would have uh, a huge impact on, on the way things are done. Um, not all harbours are looking to, uh, to take on, or will be able to take on... Um, uh, asset management, um, and so, so it, it's not going to be a particular issue for, for everyone. But uh, as I said, it, it, there is separately uh, a licensing process for uh, activities that have an impact on the environment, so um, that will still be there, and that is still quite a um, comprehensive process. But my understanding, though, is that harbour authorities do have some responsibilities in relation to the environment. They're appropriate authority, responsible authorities when it comes to um, assessments under the habitats regulations. So there are, there is a, there is a role there. How, how do, how do harbour authorities deal with that in terms of governance? Well, it depends if they have, yeah, to if, then... if they have designations within their statutory harbour area, then they, again, they already deal with those in, in the set way they have to, um, and that will depend on, on the management measures that are, that are set out um, for them, and, and that will be dependent on the uh, on various designations. But um, I don't see how I don't see that fundamentally changing. So, would you see harbour authorities as being um, fit bodies to take on, uh, you know, delegated management or, or transfers without any reform of the current Abs current governance arrangements? Uh, uh, well, absolutely. I mean, um, harbour authorities have. As I said, statutory responsibilities um, and for assets that they don't own, so which makes that um, uh, quite tricky sometimes um, to, to, to carry those out in, in an efficient way. Um, I, I think harbour authorities are generally uh, good stewards of the environment. Um, uh, development is usually carried out in a sustainable way. As I said, it's it's all licensable. Um, owning owning the asset doesn't mean that development or or activity is going to be just going ahead without um, permissions from the various uh, licensing bodies uh, are, if, if, uh, if asset management was devolved to, to an authority. Okay, and, and other sectors, I mean, it, does the aquaculture industry have an interest in owning seabed or having delegated management of seabed or...? Um, would, would be the simple answer. Right. Um, however, we don't really see any particular difficulty in, in the devolution of, of management arrangements. And um, in fact, I could probably see quite a lot of enhancement from the point of view of cohesive community planning, um, from um, being part of the community planning and local planning process. And I think Crown Estate certainly should have a role, or, or whoever manages Crown Estate assets should certainly have a role in, in that whole process, because that will get down to the, 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 the wider relationships and needs that a community has and, and how best to align to that. From an aquaculture point of view, that's entirely what, what would be most appropriate. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yeah. Yes, good morning. Um, can you give me your view on the case for national or local management? Who should manage the assets? Does a geographical approach to asset management present any risks to strategic decision-making across Scotland or make it take uh, create account of more locally specific considerations. Patricia Walter. Um, I think from uh, an offshore renewables perspective, particularly commercial, large commercial off uh, offshore wind, uh, it's critically important that it's done at a, a national level. I think there's a, an important function for one body to look at all the opportunities for development uh, around our shores and to try and work out where the best uh, combination of developments may be. And, and that process has to be done uh, with an overview of Scotland and Scottish waters as a whole. All of the developers who have indicated an interest in, in developing and all the opportunities for development there, be, there may be. So I think our, our experience 
thus far has been that a centralised process is best. Uh, and I think we would be very keen to make sure that that uh, prevails. There is another licensing round imminent, uh, we think, at the, at the start of next year. And it's, it's very important, I think, uh, in terms of remaining competitive uh, in the offshore sector uh, in the UK overall, that, that we have that centralised, streamlined process uh, that is able to look at all the opportunities and select from that the best combination for optimising renewable energy and, and the best combination for Scotland. What about the interaction, if I may, um, at this point, between the role of the Crown Estate and Marine Scotland for offshore renewables? Does that work sufficiently effectively? I think it does. In my view, they, they perform quite different roles. Uh, Marine Scotland is, is obviously the, the chief consenting licensing authority uh, and are very much involved in the marine planning process. Crown Estate operate primarily as the landlord and the, the lessor of the, of the seabed, but, but they are engaging very closely with Marine Scotland in that process. And I think it is critically important that the marine planning sits alongside the, the leasing process, so that is a very important dynamic, and I think it works well with Marine Scotland and the Crown Estate, as it okay, is. Thank you. Dr Wells. Certainly in terms of the, the, the salmon fishing, some of our members have expressed interest in, uh, in, in managing those, the, those fisheries. I think fisheries management works best when it's undertaken at the catchment scale, and the District Salmon Fishery Boards and the Fisheries Trust operate on that scale, rather than a, a smaller scale. So um, that's, a, that's a useful element. Um, in terms of management, District Salmon Fishery Boards, since the, the 2013 legislation that went through, have operated under a legal duty to comply with various good governance requirements. So they have to hold public meetings, they have to publish annual accounts and uh, annual reports and things like that. So I think they're, they're, they're a pretty good fit for this. But one of the questions that we, we have is, is just to uh, be clear that they do fit under the... the, the um, the, the community organisation element of this, or if they don't, whether or not uh, Section 61B actually allows Scottish ministers to designate the, the District Salmon Fishery Boards or the Trusts uh, as part of that process, because they're, they're not a clear fit into any of the other categories. OK, does anybody else want to come in on this before Mr Lyle comes back? Mark Simmons and then David Sanderson. Yes, uh, well, our view was, was for, for a mix of uh, management options. Um, our slight concern is that um, there are some... Uh, ports. What, what we don't want to see is uh, is bodies taking on the management of assets uh, and taking over the management of statutory harbour assets within a statutory harbour area without ports being consulted. Um, and it, th there are some cases where you can you can see where that might cause also competition issues because the the uh, body taking over that that management. May also have uh, may also own harbours that compete uh, with with, uh, with with the harbour in question. So, um, in, in those cases, th there are some some questions that, that we, we that we have. But um, our, our main view is that whatever happens, uh, we'd like um, ports and harbours. As I said at the beginning, obviously can't can't move away. There's no choice there. They have to deal with with whoever they have. So we would um, we would like to see or well, ensure that ports are uh, consulted and in, in a meaningful way. David Sanderson. Um, we, we feel that um, there's definitely a case for very strong national policy um, uh, uh, settings for, for what the Crown Estate does in Scotland. However, um, in that regard, we don't really have any fundamental objection to the, whatever level of devolution might be appropriate in terms of different management arrangements. What we'd like to see, however, is is, is a, a degree of consistency in, te in terms of how that actually is implemented and some checks and balances. So we certainly need to see that the, the national policy context is the over the, 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 the uh, uh, umbrella, if you like, that, that, that covers that and, and, and checks that from time to time. Mr Lyle. Sorry, uh, Patricia Hawthorne, do you want to come on? I wonder if I could just come back and to say one of the challenges that we have as Scottish Renewables is that we, we represent a, a wide range of interests and we have amongst our members island councils and, and we have also uh, wave and tidal developers. So I think it's probably correct that I add to my previous comments that I can see the benefit in considering un almost unique uh, opportunities such as are offered up in the islands uh, for that type of development and I understand a number of pilot projects 
are being considered. I think that seems like a very sensible approach to look at it on a pilot basis first. Mr Lyle. Can I welcome uh, Patricia um, Hawthorne? Seemingly changing slightly in midstream, but Mark Sim uh, Simmons must have been uh, reading my second question as I wrote it down. But, you know, shouldn't we have a different policy in different areas in order to innovate, um, allow people like yourself, Patricia, to, you know, expand? Uh, we've got two governments, 32, you know, if we take UK government, Scottish government, 32 different councils who do 32 different things in their local areas. So shouldn't we be able to diversify, do different things in different areas in order to innovate and allow people like yourself to explore the potential of Scotland? Just come back in on that. Um, yes, I, I added my additional comments because I think it is, we always have to remember that we have a range of interests within our membership. I can see quite clearly that there is a need and a wish uh, within the Islands Councils to get involved on a community level. For the rest of the industry, um, we have very large-scale infrastructure developments to deliver. Uh, it's a national priority, and we have to try and find the very best developments around Scottish waters. So, yes, I think we are supportive of the position that uh, this is looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, on a, on a functional basis, maybe rather than geographic. Um, but for me, uh, offshore, large-scale uh, commercial wind farms are a game-changer for Scotland, mm. and I think we have to look at that at a national level. Yeah, uh, just slight, slight come back in. Do you think, and I'm going to be really controversial, I'm sure I'll get people coming back at me when I say this, do you think pl planning applications for, let's like, say, so you, you guys should be decided by national government rather than local government? Our offshore developers value very highly the relationships they have with the local councils because all of the offshore developments come onshore somewhere and actually the communities that are most directly affected are, are the ones that are looking at the applications for substations, for cables, for other infrastructure that might be required. So um, yes, the consent at the offshore part of the substation, uh, uh, of the generating station and the cable are taken at a national level. And I think that's correct. One party has the overview of, of where we, we provide our, our major generation assets going forward. But there is always that local connection because these sites have to come onshore somewhere. And it's a very important relationship because the economic development will, will be based around that substation and, and uh, cable. Thank you. It's a question I always want to ask. Thanks. <laughs> this actually moves into question Ali, uh, Angus MacDonald wants to ask, but before that, Stuart Stevenson briefly. Um, just just a, a very small question. I take it, given the powers that ministers have to exercise under sections 36 and 37 of the Electricity Act that relate to generation consents and transmission consents, that there is a framework within which ministers are applying national policy uh, and, and considering the overall picture rather than it actually being decided except in pretty small offshore wind. I doubt a wind farm would be less, offshore would be less than 50 megawatts. Yeah. I mentioned Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, Mayor. Yes, um, expanding on the, the management theme, um, in the submission, the, the written submission from Scottish Renewables, um, it was suggested uh, that the Crown Estate has specialist legal uh, GIS consenting and commercial expertise, which it's not thought to exist currently in local authorities. Um, and in addition, the Royal Yachting Association, in their submission, uh, has also warned of a potential dilution of expertise. Um, so in your respective areas, uh, what expertise, skills and capacity is required by a manager in the case of the Scottish Crown Estate? Yeah. First on that, um, I'm a great believer that uh, you can acquire skills in any context if you have a function to carry out. So I, I would say that skills can be amassed elsewhere. What I think is incredibly important for our offshore sector at the moment is the experience that has built up within the Crown Estate uh, and the Crown Estate Scotland and Crown Estate in London 
you know, are, are still engaging a lot and, and uh, in detail about how they carry out the licensing function for offshore wind. So to me, it's not necessarily about the skills, it's about the knowledge, experience and expertise and the ability to compare and contrast opportunities. I would agree with that as well. Um, although just to add that something that has been suggested is that they could be a, retained a, a national um, administrative uh, body that, that, could, that could help um, local or regional bodies with, with such uh, skill shortages if they arise. Okay. Alan Wills. I think there are obviously skills within the Crown Estate in terms of the, the, the salmon fishings, but uh, as I said earlier on, a lot of the, the, the fishings are, 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 are leased to angling clubs and all the rest of it, and there's a lot of uh, expertise within our sector as well. Um, I, I think there is some, some, some acknowledgement that there are, there are skills at national level that are very, very helpful from a range of different aspects. However, I don't think that from our point of view um, that, re that really is a problem. Um, we, we are effectively looking at a leasing arrangement and a landlord arrangement, and as long as the, the body that's carrying that out is competent in those kind of functions, then that, that, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Finley Cash. Still in the context that the Smith Commission recommended that there be further devolution to, to local authorities and, and your comments on the pros and cons of that have been very helpful. But in the, the, the instance that uh, powers were devolved, how can we assess if a manager has the, necess the, 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 the necessary expertise and capacity to manage those assets um, which would uh, fulfil the objectives of the Crown Estate? I think that's where we probably would welcome a pilot scheme approach. Um, I think that before we know that, we have to test the water. And um, I don't think for one minute that there can't be further devolution arrangements. However, I think it's sensible to think about it from a pilot scheme point of view as it moves forward. Um, it's, it's, it's not new territory entirely. The Crown Estate already have, have different arrangements with, uh, with, with the agents who do their, their, their work in different parts of Scotland. Uh, therefore, I don't think we, we should um, um, take too strong a view on that until we've done a pilot scheme. Anyone else? No? OK. okay uh, moving on then. What would you see as the implications uh, if for the practice of cross subsidies in the financial support that Crown Estate Scotland provides for different types of assets, if management were to be decentralised, I'm thinking specifically, I mean, the offshore renewables is a, a considerable earner for um, the Crown Estate and will be substantially so in the future. But agricultural tenancies, for, for example, benefit from the current approach. Um, I recognise it for many of you, it's probably not really an issue, but do you have a view on this? about the pros and cons of the two approaches. Alan Wells. To say that that cross-subsidy element is an important element, it would be very useful to retain it. Okay. David Sanderson. Um, we're aware that our sector are effectively uh, 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 a cash generator for the Crown, and therefore we support a number of different um, aspects of Crown State business throughout the, the country. Um, we have no strong view that that sort of balance shouldn't continue. Um, we, we see great value in, in having at least some input to what's happening at national level in terms of projects that have got a national significance. Um, however, we as a sector would like to see, whatever the new arrangement is, some sort of uh, 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 scheme whereby the, the, the receipts, if you like, the, the, the income from, from our activities goes back into supporting the sustainable development of our activities for the future and for generating uh, uh, potential for growth. Okay. Okay, thank you. Donald Cameron. Yes. So can, I, can I refer to my register of interest as a, a landowner in the Highlands? Um, can I ask you about section six of the bill, which, as you'll know, will... Um, uh, intends to confer on ministers the power to restrict the disposal of certain assets, uh, such as the seabed, and it's that which I'm interested in asking you about. Um, during the consultation, a question went out that asked, should the existing policy, namely the general presumption against selling the seabed, be maintained? And I think it's fair to say that uh, the significant majority of respondents um, asked for that to be the case albeit there were some respondents who, who didn't. Can I ask you, 
um, your views on whether the sale of a portion of the seabed should be subject to ministerial consent, uh, as per section six of the bill, and also, indeed, whether you think the bill should be amended to explicitly uh, prevent the sale of the seabed. Mark Simmons. Um, no, I don't think the bill should be amended to prevent the sale of uh, portions of the seabed. Obviously, we're just I'm just speaking in terms, uh, just in reference to ports and harbours. Um, our view is that it's um, fairly straightforward that uh, if you have a statutory duty to uh, to to uh, sort of either you know, maintain those assets or work with those assets then it's not unreasonable that you should be able to uh, purchase them or own them. Uh, and and so one or two ports have been able to do that, but, um, it's, but most obviously haven't. And uh, in, our, in the experience of our members, it just adds to um, the cost and time it takes to, um, to, do, their, to do their jobs. So no, we, we wouldn't agree with that. Anyone else? Anyone else? Can I point to what the advantage would be in selling bits of the seabed? To deal, not having to deal with the Crown Estate and um, or f for licensing or, uh, or or renewing leases and things like that. The public benefit be uh, a more efficient uh, ports and harbours sector, and ports and harbours obviously um, bring benefits to 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 the coastal communities that they're based in. They uh, provide direct jobs, they support industries, fishing, manufacturing, all sorts of things. Um, if uh, development is stunted in ports and harbours, then that, uh, that harms the communities in which they're based. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Um, thinking of the issue of dredging, where there are environmental consents required, leaving that to one side, would it nonetheless make it easier for ports uh, to not have to interact with the Crown Estate if they own the ground that they have to dredge, which is a common activity in many ports? And are there other examples besides the one that I bring forward that would help us understand the sides of the argument? Yes, absolutely. I, I agree with that. Um, there are plenty of other, other things that they do, um, uh, fixing um, aids navigation to, or, uh, or, or other things to the seabed. There's, there's quite a, a few uh, ways that ports interact with, with the seabed within their harbour area. Uh, and then there's also... Um, general maintenance, uh, development of, um, of, of the, of the harbour in, in terms of, you know, adding new keys or pontoons or, or whatever else it might be. Donald, do you finish that? I, I just wonder if anyone else has got comments on owning the seabed. Um, no, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. There are a number of Scottish government strategies and uh, whether that's over um, national, regional, marine plans, local development plans, community planning processes, Scottish energy strategy, tourism strategy, and food and drink strategies. Obviously, each of you will have members with an interest in, in each of these strategies. What do you consider to be the key opportunities for the public management of the coastal and marine assets to contribute to these and other strategies? And I realise that that's a huge question, but particularly, in light of the interests of your own members and specific strategies. Thank you. Um, I, I, that leads me in nicely to a couple of points, maybe. Um, I, I completely see the need for whatever arrangements we've got in Scotland to be very well aligned to a range of those strategies that may or may not touch on different, different aspects of life. Um, in terms of the arrangements that might be most appropriate, I think the focus on community planning is a really appropriate one and, and what falls out of community planning and getting community planning to work really well for everybody, whether it be the individual in the community, a business or, a, or an organisation. Um, and I think that's where I'd like to see as much alignment as possible between how you deliver these things and how the national policy context is taken into consideration when you go about your business. I think this is where throughout Scotland, we can certainly improve our lot by, by doing well and doing better at community planning. I think from a sort of migratory fish perspective, we've, we, we've got a num number of issues. The, 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 the number of fish surviving at sea has gone from about 20% of fish that leave the rivers coming back to about 5%. So there's something going on at sea that we really need to, to look after. So, 
Uh, in terms of the, the overall sustainability and what we do in the marine environment and how that's assessed and all the rest of it, I think there's an important role there. But uh, w one element that I think would be really important from our members' perspective is, is to have a more resource to actually be able to deal with some of these issues. So our, our members deal with huge offshore wind farms, deal with aquaculture, deal, deal with har harbour developments and all the rest of it. In terms of that sort of wider social and, uh, and environmental benefit, a bit more resource coming into actually hel hel helping that, that process work through to make sure that the decisions take, that take place are in the right places and, uh, and for the right reasons would be very helpful from that perspective. So I don't know if that's specifically in relation to your question, but I think it's an important element in terms of uh, what we would like to see going forward. Point, because if, if, if you consider that two or three years ago there was a theory, and it may still be relevant, that one of the impacts of migratory fish was the electromagnetic currents being generated by the cables from offshore um, activity in a variety of ways. And there was a piece of work done by Marine Scotland that was quite inconclusive. So we still have that question mark, and here's two kind of major contributors to the Crown Estate coming together in that regard. Is that an area that you would think was worth the Crown Estate taking a role in exploring? And to be fair, I think the Crown Estate have taken a role in that thing. So I, I don't know whether Crown Estate put money into that, that Marine Scotland research or not, but it certainly took place up at the lab in Aberdeen. Uh, it looked at one particular sort of, I can't remember whether it was AC or DC, but it looked at one form of cabling, but not, not the other. So I think that question is, is still there to some, 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 some way, shape or form. But uh, having said that, through the process, we have been successful in, in, in it, uh, not, not just ourselves, but you know the, the, the licensing arrangements have, have required cables to be buried or to have rock shielding put on them to, to deal with these sort of issues. So, um, but there's an awful lot involved in actually going through those processes. When you get the, uh, the, the paperwork that comes in for an offshore wind farm, it gets delivered in boxes. Um, and, and, you know, my members are relatively small organisations having to deal with these sort of things. So some, some more resource, whether it's top sliced or however it works in question, would be very, very helpful to get good decisions coming through in the process. Okay. Right. Kate Forbes. Just uh, one final question, and it may just be a yes or no answer. But um, in terms of the definition of community when it comes to the management of the seabed, uh, would you support extension of that definition to community of interest to be able to include your own respective interests? Alan Wells. What I said earlier on, I think we're seeking clarity in terms of that definition. I would hope that a district salmon fishery board or indeed a fishery trust would fall under that, but I'm uh, um, not 100% clear on that at the moment. I see some heads nodding around the table. David Sanderson, do you want to come back on that? I would say that we, we, we as, a, as an industry, would have no desire to be, to be recognised in that way as in, in, in terms of the, the, the functional approach. So I don't think there's, a, there's any ambiguity about that. Okay. Patricia Hawthorne. I think, I think the definition of community can get very complicated <laughs> from time to time, so uh, I'd be inclined to agree with David on that. Okay. Well, I think we've covered all the topics that we had for you today. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm going to suspend for a couple of minutes till we move to the next uh, element of our work today. Thank you.
Welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The fourth item on the agenda is to initially consider petition PE1646 by Caroline Hayes on drinking water supplies in Scotland. The petition is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to one, review the role of the Drinking Water Quality Regulator and two, commission independent research into the safety of chlorum, chlor chloramination uh, of drinking water. This has been referred to the Environment Committee um, following scrutiny by the Public Petitions Committee, which has taken evidence on this from stakeholders. Paper 5 uh, outlines the previous scrutiny of the Petitions Committee and suggests some possible options available to this committee. Members may, of course, wish to suggest alternative actions in relation to the petition, and I invite comments. Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. Just to confirm that having um, spoken previously to the petitioners as the MSP for the area, um, the strength of feeling there is locally about this issue and my um, strong support for um, considering this issue. I think that there are still outstanding questions, not just around the chloramination, but also in terms of being a long-standing process since about 2012, when Scottish Water um, changed the source of the water and chloramination was a subsequent treatment for issues that had been raised about the water. Richard Lyle. Yeah, I certainly agree with my colleague, and I think it's uh, you know the concern that people have. At the end of the day, if we're wanting to drink, you know, we're drinking water, we should know what we're drinking, and to put stuff into it that I don't want, uh, I think people should be advised or consulted first. So I, I agree with the proposal. John Scott. Um, I agree with the proposal as suggested. Um, it has been raised by my constituents as well. Um, quite a few of them. This. Uh, chloramination process. Um, so I would be interested to hear um, the justification for it. And finally, Cass. Concerns raised over just the, uh, exactly what the difference between chlorination and uh, chloramination is. And I think there's some scientific or chemical analysis that needs to be understood. And I don't think Scottish Water have answered those questions that certainly have been raised over quite a number of years so yeah absolutely agree with the thank you for teaching me how to pronounce that as well uh, angus mcdonald you know, um, serving on the petitions committee um i was present when the petitioners gave evidence uh, a number of well, a few months ago now i think um, and they presented a, a very strong case um, so i would be keen to certainly raise the issue when we have uh, scottish water in front of us um, just after recess so to be clear and for the record um, what we would be agreeing to, from what I hear from colleagues, is that we will raise concerns stemming from the petition with Scottish Water at our next meeting on Tuesday the 17th of April and thereafter formally consider the petition at the earliest available opportunity um, subject to work programme considerations. Are we agreed? Could, so, we, could we make sure that Scottish Water know that we're going to ask them so that they don't come in and say, oh, we don't know about that? Uh, that matter will be dealt with. I can give you that assurance. So we are agreed, are we? We are agreed. Thank you. Um, at its next meeting on the 17th of April, the committee will take oral evidence uh, from stakeholders on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill and, as we just heard, from Scottish Walk Water on its latest annual report and, of course, on this petition. Um, I therefore uh, close this meeting uh, of the committee and move, we move into private.